chapter seventeen of antique hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen the two o'clock snorted out of charing cross but no healths were drunk this time to viscount lascelles a desiccating sobriety made arid the corner of the third-class carriage in which gumbrell was sitting his thoughts were an interminable desert of sand with not a palm in sight not so much as a comforting mirage once again he fumbled in his breast pocket brought out and unfolded the flimsy paper once more he read how many times had he read before your telegram made me very unhappy not merely because of the accident though it made me shudder to think that something terrible might have happened poor darling but also selfishly my own disappointment i had looked forward so much i had made a picture of it all so clearly i should have met you at the station with the horse and trap from the chequers and we'd have driven back to the cottage and you'd have loved the cottage we'd have had tea and i'd have made you eat an egg with it after your journey then we'd have gone for a walk through the most heavenly wood i found yesterday to a place where there's a wonderful view miles and miles of it and we'd have wandered on and on and sat down under the trees and the sun would have set and the twilight would slowly have come to an end and we'd have gone home again and found the lamps lighted and supper ready not very grand i'm afraid for mrs vole isn't the best of cooks and then the piano for there is a piano and i had the tuner come specially from hastings yesterday so that it isn't so bad now and you'd have played and perhaps i would have made my noises on it and at last it would have been time for candles and bed when i heard you were coming theodore i told mrs vole a lie about you i said you were my husband because she's fearfully respectable of course and it would dreadfully disturb her if you weren't but i told myself that too i meant that you should be you see i tell you everything i'm not ashamed i wanted to give you everything i could and then we should always be together loving one another and i should have been your slave i should have been your property and lived inside your life but you would always have had to love me and then just as i was getting ready to go and call at the chequers for the horse and trap your telegram came i saw the word accident and i imagined you all bleeding and smashed oh dreadful dreadful but then when you seem to make rather a joke of it why did you say a little indisposed that seemed somehow so stupid i thought and said you were coming to-morrow it wasn't that which upset me it was the dreadful dreadful disappointment it was like a stab that disappointment it hurt so terribly so unreasonably much it made me cry and cry so that i thought i should never be able to stop and then gradually i began to see that the pain of the disappointment wasn't unreasonably great it wasn't merely a question of your coming being put off for a day it was a question of its being put off for ever of my never seeing you again i saw that that accident had been something really arranged by providence it was meant to warn me 
and show me what i ought to do i saw how hopelessly impracticable the happiness i had been imagining really was i saw that you didn't you couldn't love me in anything like the same way as i loved you i was only a curious adventure a new experience a means to some other end mind i'm not blaming you in the least i'm only telling you what is true what i gradually came to realize as true if you'd come what then i'd have given you everything my body my mind my soul my whole life i'd have twisted myself into the threads of your life and then when in due course you wanted to make an end to this curious little adventure you would have had to cut the tangle and it would have killed me it would also have hurt you at least i think it would in the end i thank god for the accident which had prevented you coming in this way providence lets us off very lightly you with a bruise or two for i do hope it really is nothing my precious darling and me with a bruise inside round the heart but both will get well quite soon and all our lives we shall have an afternoon under the trees an evening of music and in the darkness a night and eternity of happiness to look back on i shall go away from robert's bridge at once good-bye theodore what a long letter the last you'll ever get from me the last what a dreadful hurting word that is i shall take it to post at once for fear if i leave it i may be weak enough to change my mind and let you come to-morrow i shall take it at once then i shall come home again and pack up and tell some new fib to mrs vole and after that perhaps i shall allow myself to cry again good-bye aridly the desert of sand stretched out with not a tree and not even a mirage except perhaps the vague and desperate hope that he might get there before she started that she might conceivably have changed her mind ah if only he'd read the letter a little earlier but he hadn't woken up before eleven he hadn't been down before half-past sitting at the breakfast-table he had read the letter through the eggs and bacon had grown still colder if that was possible than they were he had read it through he had rushed to the a b c there was no practicable train before the two o'clock if he had taken the seven twenty seven he would certainly have got there before she started ah if only he had woken up a little earlier but then he would have had to go to bed a little earlier and in order to go to bed earlier he would have had to abandon mrs vaviche before she had bored herself to that ultimate point of fatigue at which she did at last feel ready for repose and to abandon mrs vaviche ah that was really impossible she wouldn't allow herself to be left alone if only he hadn't gone to the london library yesterday a wanton unnecessary visit it had been for after all the journey was short he didn't need a book for the train and the life of beckford for which he had asked proved of course to be out and he had been utterly incapable of thinking of any other book among the two or three hundred thousand on the shelves that he wanted to read and in any case what the devil did he want with the life of beckford hadn't he his own life the life of gumbrell to attend to wasn't one life enough without making superfluous visits to the london library in search of other lives and then what a stroke of bad luck to have run into mrs vaviche at that very moment what an abject weakness to have let himself be bullied into sending that telegram a little indisposed oh my god Cumbrell shut his eyes and ground his teeth together he felt himself blushing with a retrospective shame and of course it was quite useless taking the train like this to robert's bridge she'd be gone of course still there was always the desperate hope there was the mirage across the desiccated plains 
the mirage one knew to be deceptive and which on a second glance proved not even to be a mirage but merely a few livery spots behind the eyes still it was amply worth doing as a penance and to satisfy the conscience and to deceive oneself with an illusion of action and then the fact that he was to have spent the afternoon with rosie and had put her off that too was highly satisfying and not merely put her off but ultimate clownery in the worst of deliriously bad taste played a joke on her impossible to come to you meet me two thirteen sloan street second floor a little indisposed he wondered how she'd get on with mr mar captain for it was to his rococo boudoir and crebillon sold sofa that he had on the spur of the clownish moment as he dashed into the post-office on the way to the station sent her aridly the desiccated waist extended had she been right in her letter would it really have lasted no more than a little while and ended as she prophesied with an agonizing cutting of the tangle or could it be that she had held out the one hope of happiness wasn't she perhaps the one unique being with whom he might have learned to await in quietness the final coming of that lovely terrible thing from before the sound of whose secret footsteps more than once and oh ignobly he had fled he could not decide it was impossible to decide until he had seen her again till he had possessed her mingled his life with hers and now she had eluded him for he knew very well that he would not find her he sighed and looked out of the window the train pulled up at a small suburban station suburban for though london was already some way behind the little sham half-timbered houses near the station the newer tile and rough-cast dwellings farther out on the slope of the hill proclaimed with emphasis the presence of the business man the holder of the season ticket cumbrel looked at them with a pensive disgust which must have expressed itself on his features for the gentleman sitting in the corner of the carriage facing his suddenly leaned forward tapped him on the knee and said i see you agree with me sir that there are too many people in the world gumbrell who up till now had merely been aware that somebody was sitting opposite him now looked with more attention at the stranger he was a large square old gentleman of robust and flourishing appearance with a face of wrinkled brown parchment and a white moustache that merged in a handsome curve with a pair of side whiskers in a manner which reminded one of the photographs of the emperor francis joseph i perfectly agree with you sir cumbrell answered if he had been wearing his beard he would have gone on to suggest that loquacious old gentleman in trains or among the supernumeraries of the planet as it was however he spoke with courtesy and smiled in his most engaging fashion when i look at all these revolting houses the old gentleman continued shaking his fist at the snuggeries of the season ticket holders i am filled with indignation i feel my spleen ready to burst sir ready to burst i can sympathize with you said Gumbrell the architecture is certainly not very soothing it's not the architecture i mind so much retorted the old gentleman that's merely a question of art and all nonsense so far as i'm concerned what disgusts me is the people inside the architecture the number of them sir and the way they breed like maggots sir like maggots millions of them creeping about the face of the country spreading blight and dirt wherever they go ruining everything it's the people i object to ah well said gumbel if you will have sanitary conditions that don't allow plagues to flourish properly if you will tell mothers how to bring up their children instead of allowing nature to kill them off in her natural way if you will import unlimited supplies of corn and meat what can you expect of course the numbers go up the old gentleman waved all this away i don't care what the causes are he said that's all one to me what i do object to sir is the effects why sir i'm old enough to remember walking through the delicious meadows 
beyond swiss cottage i remember seeing the cows milked in west hampstead sir and now what do i see now when i go there hideous red cities pululating with jews sir pululating with prosperous jews am i right in being indignant sir do i do well like the prophet jonah to be angry you do sir said gumbel with growing enthusiasm and the more so since this frightful increase in population is the world's most formidable danger at the present time with populations that in europe alone expand by millions every year no political foresight is possible a few years of this mere bestial propagation will suffice to make nonsense of the wisest schemes of to-day or would suffice he hastened to correct himself if any wise schemes were being matured at the present very possibly sir said the old gentleman but what i object to is seeing good corn-land being turned into streets and meadows where cows used to graze covered with houses full of useless and disgusting human beings i resent seeing the country parcelled out into back gardens and is there any prospect gumbel earnestly asked of our ever being able in the future to support the whole of our population will unemployment ever decrease i don't know sir the old gentleman replied but the families of the unemployed will certainly increase you are right sir said gumbel they will and the families of the employed and the prosperous will as steadily grow smaller it is regrettable that birth control should have begun at the wrong end of the scale there seems to be a level of poverty below which it doesn't seem worth while practising birth control and a level of education below which birth control is regarded as morally wrong strange how long it has taken for the ideas of love and procreation to dissociate themselves in the human mind in the majority of minds they are still even in the so-called twentieth century indivisibly wedded still he continued hopefully progress is being made progress is certainly though slowly being made it is gratifying to find for example in the latest statistics that the clergy as a class are now remarkable for the smallness of their families the old jest is out of date is it too much to hope that these gentlemen may bring themselves in time to preach what they already practise it is too much to hope sir the old gentleman answered with decision you are probably right said gumbel if we were all to preach all the things we all practise continued the old gentleman the world would soon be a pretty sort of bear garden i can tell you yes and a monkey house and a wart hoggery as it is sir it is merely a place where there are too many human beings vice must pay its tribute to virtue or else we are all undone i admire your wisdom sir said gumbel the old gentleman was delighted and i have been much impressed by your philosophical reflections he said tell me are you at all interested in old brandy well not philosophically said gumbel as a mere empiric only as a mere empiric the old gentleman laughed then let me beg you to accept a case i have a cellar which i shall never drink dry alas before i die my only wish is that what remains of it shall be distributed among those who can really appreciate it in you sir i see a fitting recipient of a case of brandy you overwhelm me said gumbel you are too kind and i may add too flattering the train which was a mortally slow one came grinding for what seemed the hundredth time to a halt not at all said the old gentleman if you have a card sir gumbel searched his pockets i have come without one never mind said the old gentleman i think i have a pencil if you will give me your name and address i will have the case sent to you at once leisurely he hunted for the pencil he took out a notebook the train gave a jerk forward now sir he said 
gumbrell began dictating theodore he said slowly the o door the old gentleman repeated syllable by syllable the train crept on with slowly gathering momentum through the station happening to look out of the window at this moment gumbrell saw the name of the place painted across a lamp it was robert's bridge he made a loud inarticulate noise flung open the door of the compartment stepped out on to the footboard and jumped he landed safely on the platform staggered forward a few paces with his acquired momentum and came at last to a halt a hand reached out and closed the swinging door of his compartment and an instant afterwards through the window a face that at a distance looked more than ever like the face of the emperor francis joseph looked back towards the receding platform the mouth opened and shut no words were audible standing on the platform gumbrell made a complicated pantomime signifying his regret by shrugging his shoulders and placing his hand on his heart urging in excuse for his abrupt departure the necessity under which he laboured of alighting at this particular station which he did by pointing at the name on the boards and lamps then at himself then at the village across the fields the old gentleman waved his hand which still held gumbrell noticed the notebook in which he had been writing then the train carried him out of sight there went the only case of old brandy he was ever likely to possess thought gumbrell sadly as he turned away suddenly he remembered emily again for a long time he had quite forgotten her the cottage when at last he found it proved to be fully as picturesque as he had imagined and emily of course had gone leaving as might have been expected no address he took the evening train back to london the aridity was now complete and even the hope of a mirage had vanished there was no old gentleman to make a diversion the size of clergymen's families even the fate of europe seemed unimportant now were indeed perfectly indifferent to him End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of antique hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen two hundred and thirteen sloane street the address rosie reflected as she vaporized synthetic lilies of the valley over all her sinuous person was decidedly a good one it argued a reasonable prosperity attested a certain distinction the knowledge of his address confirmed her already high opinion of the bearded stranger who had so surprisingly entered her life as though in fulfilment of all the fortune-teller's prophecies that ever were made had entered yes and intimately made himself at home she had been delighted when the telegram came that morning to think that at last she was going to find out something more about this man of mystery for dark and mysterious he had remained remote even in the midst of the most intimate contacts why she didn't even know his name call me toto he had suggested when she asked him what it was and toto she had had to call him for lack of anything more definite or committal but to-day he was letting her further into his secret rosie was delighted her pink underclothing she decided as she looked in the long glass was really ravishing she examined herself turning first one way then the other looking over her shoulder to see the effect from behind she pointed a toe bent and straightened a knee applauding the length of her legs most women toto had said are like dachshunds their slenderness and plump suavity of form in their white stockings of milanese silk they look delicious and how marvellously by the way those selfridge people 
had mended those stockings by their new patent process absolutely like new and only charged four shillings well it was time to dress good-bye then to the pink underclothing and the long white legs she opened the wardrobe door the moving glass reflected as it swung through its half-circle pink bed rose wreathed walls little friends of her own age and the dying saint at his last communion rosie selected the frock she had bought the other day at one of those little shops in soho there they sell such smart things so cheaply to a clientage of minor actresses and cocottes toto hadn't seen it yet she looked extremely distinguished in it the little hat with its inch of veil hanging like a mask unconcealing and inviting from the brim suited her to perfection one last dab of powder one last squirt of synthetic lilies of the valley and she was ready she closed the door behind her st jerome was left to communicate in the untenanted pinkness mr murkapton sat at his writing-table an exquisitely amusing affair in paper mache inlaid with floral decorations in mother-of-pearl and painted with views of windsor castle and tintern in the romantic manner of prince albert's later days polishing to its final and gem-like perfection one of his middle articles it was on a splendid subject the jeu prima noctis or droit du seigneur that delicious droit wrote mr murkapton on which one likes to think the sovereigns of england insist so firmly in their motto dieu et mon droit de seigneur that was charming mr murkapton thought as he read it through and he liked that bit which began elegiacally but alas the right of the first night belongs to a middle age as mystical albeit happily different as those dismal epochs invented by morris or by chesterton the lord's right as we prettily imagine it is a figment of the baroque imagination of the seventeenth century it never existed or at least it did exist but as something deplorably different from what we love to picture it and he went on eruditely to refer to that council of carthage which in three ninety eight demanded of the faithful that they should be continent on their wedding night it was the lord's right the droit of the heavenly seigneur on this text of fact mr murkapton went on to preach a brilliant sermon on that melancholy sexual perversion known as continence how much happier we all should be if the real historical droit du seigneur had in fact been the mythical right of our pretty prurient imaginations he looked forward to a golden age when all should be seigneurs possessing rights that should have brought him down into universal liberty and so on mr murkapton read through his creation with a smile of satisfaction on his face every here and there he made a careful correction in red ink over pretty prurient imaginations his pen hung for a full minute in conscientious hesitation wasn't it perhaps a little too strongly alliterative a shade perhaps cheap perhaps pretty lascivious or delicate prurient would be better he repeated the alternative several times rolling the sound of them round his tongue judicially like a tea-taster in the end he decided that pretty prurient was right pretty prurient they were the mot juste decidedly without a question mr murkapton had just come to this decision and his poise pen was moving farther down the page when he was disturbed by the sound of arguing voices in the corridor outside his room what is it mrs goldie he called irritably for it was not difficult to distinguish 
his housekeeper's loud and querulous tones he had given orders that he was not to be disturbed in these critical moments of correction one needed such absolute tranquillity but mr murkaptan was to have no tranquillity this afternoon the door of his sacred boudoir was thrown rudely open and there strode in like a goth into the elegant marble vomitorium of petronius arbiter a haggard and dishevelled person whom mr murkaptan recognised with a certain sense of discomfort as casimir lipiat to what do i owe the pleasure of this unexpected mr murkaptan began with an essay in offensive courtesy but lipiat who had no feeling for the finer shades coarsely interrupted him look here murkaptan he said i want to have a talk with you delighted i'm sure mr murkaptan replied and what may i ask about he knew of course perfectly well and the prospect of the talk disturbed him about this said lipiat and he held out what looked like a roll of paper mr murkaptan took the roll and opened it out it was a copy of the weekly world ah said mr murkaptan in a tone of delighted surprise the world you have read my little article that was what i wanted to talk to you about said lipiat mr murkaptan modestly laughed it hardly deserves it he said preserving a calm of expression which was quite unnatural to him and speaking in a studiedly quiet voice lipiat pronounced with careful deliberation it is a disgusting malicious ignoble attack on me he said come come protested mr murkaptan a critic must be allowed to criticise but there are limits said lipiat oh i quite agree mr murkaptan eagerly conceded but after all lipiat you can't pretend that i have come anywhere near those limits if i had called you a murderer or even an adulterer then i admit you would have some cause to complain but i haven't there's nothing like a personality in the whole thing lipiat laughed derisively and his face went all to pieces like a pool of water into which a stone is suddenly dropped you merely said i was insincere an actor a mountebank a quack raving fustian spouting mock heroics that's all mr murkaptan put on the expression of one who feels himself injured and misunderstood he shut his eyes he flapped deprecatingly with his hand i merely suggested he said that you protest too much you defeat your own ends you lose emphasis by trying to be over emphatic all this folie de grandeur all this hankering after terrible da sagely mr murkaptan shook his head it's led so many people astray and in any case you can't really expect me to find it very sympathetic mr murkaptan uttered a little laugh and looked affectionately round his boudoir his retired and perfumed pouterie within whose walls so much civilization had finely flowered he looked at his magnificent sofa gilded and carved upholstered in white satin and so deep for it was a great square piece of furniture almost as broad as it was long that when you sat right back you had of necessity to lift your feet from the floor and recline at length it was under the white satin that crebillon spirit found in these late degenerate days a sympathetic home he looked at his exquisite condor fans over the mantelpiece his lovely marie laurencin of two young girls pale-skinned and berry-eyed walking embraced in a shallow myopic landscape amid a troop of bounding heraldic dogs he looked at his cabinet of bibelot in the corner where the nigger mask and the superb chinese phallus in sculptured rock crystal contrasted so amusingly with the chelsea china the little ivory madonna which might be a fake but in any case was quite as good as any mediaeval french original and the italian medals he looked at his comical writing-desk in shining black papier mache and mother-of-pearl he looked at his article on the jus primae noctis 
black and neat on the page with the red corrections attesting his tireless search for and his he flattered himself almost invariable discovery of the inevitable word no really one couldn't expect him to find lippiot's notions very sympathetic but i don't expect you to said lippiot and good god i don't want you to but you call me insincere that's what i can't and won't stand how dare you do that his voice was growing louder once more mr murkopton deprecatingly flapped at the most he corrected i said that there was a certain look of insincerity about some of the pictures hardly avoidable indeed in work of this kind quite suddenly lippiot lost his self-control all the accumulated anger and bitterness of the last days burst out his show had been a hopeless failure not a picture sold a press that was mostly bad or when good that had praised for the wrong the insulting reasons bright and effective work mr lippiot would make an excellent stage designer damn them damn them and then when the dailies had all had their yelp here was murkapton in the weekly world taking him as a text for what was practically an essay on insincerity in art how dare you he furiously shouted you how dare you talk about sincerity what can you know about sincerity you disgusting little bug and avenging himself on the person of mr murkopton against the world that had neglected him against the fate that had denied him his rightful share of talent lippiot sprang up and seizing the author of the jeu primae knocked us by the shoulders he shook him he bumped him up and down in his chair he cuffed him over the head how can you have the impudence he asked letting go of his victim but still standing menacingly over him to touch anything that even attempts to be decent and big all these years these wretched years of poverty and struggle and courageous hope and failure and repeated disappointment and now this last failure more complete than all he was trembling with anger at least one forgot unhappiness while one was angry mr murkopton had recovered from his first terrified surprise really really he repeated too barbarous scuffling like hobbledehoys if you knew lippiot began but he checked himself if you knew he was going to say what those things had cost me what they meant what thought what passion but how could murkopton understand and it would sound as though he were appealing to this creature's sympathy bug he shouted instead bug and he struck out again with the flat of his hand mr murkopton put up his hands and ducked away from the slaps blinking really he protested really insincere perhaps it was half true lippiot seized his man more furiously than before and shook him shook him and then that vile insult about the vermouth advertisement he cried out that had rankled those flaring vulgar posters you thought you could mock me and spit at me with impunity did you i've stood it so long you thought i'd always stand it was that it but you're mistaken he lifted his fist mr murkopton cowered away raising his arm to protect his head vile bug of a coward said lippiot why don't you defend yourself like a man you can only be dangerous with words very witty and spiteful and cutting about those vermouth posters wasn't it but you wouldn't dare to fight me if i challenged you well as a matter of fact said mr murkopton peering up from under his defences i didn't invent that particular piece of criticism i barred the apartheid he laughed feebly more canary than bull you borrowed it did you lippiot contemptuously repeated and who from may i ask not that it interested him in the least to know well if you really want to know said mr murkopton it was from our friend myra Vavish. lippiot stood for a moment without speaking then putting his menacing hand in his pocket he turned away oh he said non-committally 
and was silent again relieved mr murkopton sat up in his chair with the palm of his right hand he smoothed his dishevelled head airily outside in the sunshine rosie walked down sloane street looking at the numbers on the doors of the houses a hundred and ninety-nine two hundred two hundred and one she was getting near now perhaps all the people who passed strolling so easily and elegantly and disengagedly along perhaps they all of them carried behind their eyes a secret as delightful and amusing as hers rosie liked to think so it made life more exciting how nonchalantly distinguished rosie reflected she herself must look would any one who saw her now sauntering along like this would any one guess that ten houses farther down the street a young poet or at least very nearly a young poet was waiting on the second floor eagerly for her arrival of course they wouldn't and couldn't guess that was the fun and the enormous excitement of the whole thing formidable in her light-hearted detachment formidable in the passion which at will she could give rein to and check again the great lady swam beautifully along through the sunlight to satisfy her caprice like diana she stooped over the shepherd boy eagerly the starving young poet waited waited in his garret two hundred and twelve two hundred and thirteen rosie looked at the entrance and was reminded that the garret couldn't after all be very sordid nor the young poet absolutely starving she stepped in and standing in the hall looked at the board with the names ground floor mrs budge first floor f de m lo botham second floor p murkopton p murkopton but it was a charming name a romantic name a real young poet's name murkopton she felt more than ever pleased with her selection the fastidious lady could not have had a happier caprice murkopton murkopton she wondered what the p stood for peter philip patrick pendennis even she could hardly have guessed that mr murkopton's father the eminent bacteriologist had insisted thirty-four years ago on calling his first-born pasteur a little tremulous under her outward elegant calm rosie mounted the stairs twenty-five steps to the first floor one flight of thirteen which was rather disagreeably ominous and one of twelve then two flights of eleven and she was on the second landing facing a front door a bell pushed like a round eye a brass nameplate for a great lady thoroughly accustomed to this sort of thing she felt her heart beating rather unpleasantly fast it was those stairs no doubt she halted a moment took two deep breaths then pushed the bell the door was opened by an aged servant of the most forbiddingly respectable appearance mr murkoptan at home the person at the door burst at once into a long rambling angry complaint but precisely about what rosie could not for certain make out mr murkoptan had left orders she gathered that he wasn't to be disturbed but some one had come and disturbed him fairly shoved his way in so rude and inconsiderate all the same and now he'd been once disturbed she didn't see why he shouldn't be disturbed again but she didn't know what things were coming to if people fairly shoved their way in like that bolshevism she called it rosie murmured her sympathies and was admitted into a dark hall still querulously denouncing the bolsheviks who came shoving in the person led the way down a corridor and throwing open a door announced in a tone of grievance a lady to see you master pastor for mrs goldie was an old family retainer and one of the few who knew the secret of mr murkopton's christian name one of the fewer still who were privileged to employ it then as soon as rosie had stepped across the threshold she cut off her retreat with a bang and went off muttering all the time towards her kitchen it certainly wasn't a garret half a glance the first whiff of potpourri the feel of the carpet beneath her feet had been enough to prove that but it was not the room which occupied rosie's attention 
it was its occupants one of them thin sharp-featured and in rosie's very young eyes quite old was standing with an elbow on the mantelpiece the other sleeker and more genial in appearance was sitting in front of a writing desk near the window and neither of them rosy glanced desperately from one to the other hoping vainly that she might have overlooked a blond beard neither of them was toto the sleek man at the writing desk got up advanced to meet her an unexpected pleasure he said in a voice that alternately boomed and fluted too delightful but to what do i owe who may i ask he had held out his hand automatically rosy proffered hers the sleek man shook it with cordiality almost with tenderness i i think i must have made a mistake she said mr murkopton the sleek man smiled i am mr murkopton you live on the second floor i never lay claims to being a mathematician said the sleek man smiling as though to applaud himself but i've always calculated that he hesitated enfin que ma demure se trouve en effet on the second floor lippiat will bear me out i'm sure he turned to the thin man who had not moved from the fireplace but had stood all the time motionlessly his elbow on the mantelpiece looking gloomily at the ground lippiat looked up i must be going he said abruptly and he walked towards the door like vermouth posters like vermouth posters so that was myra's piece of mockery all his anger had sunk like a quenched flame he was altogether quenched put out with unhappiness politely mr murkopton hurried across the room and opened the door for him good-bye then he said airily lippiot did not speak but walked out into the hall the front door banged behind him well well said mr murkopton coming back across the room to where rosie was still irresolutely standing talk about the furor poeticus but do sit down i beg you en crebillon he indicated the vast white satin sofa i call it crebillon he explained because the soul of the great writer undoubtedly tenants it undoubtedly you know his book of course you know le sofa sinking into crebillon's soft lap rosie had to admit that she didn't know le sofa she had begun to recover her self-possession if this wasn't the young poet it was certainly a young poet and a very peculiar one too as a great lady she laughingly accepted the odd situation not no le sofa exclaimed mr murkopton oh but my dear and mysterious young lady let me lend you a copy of it at once no education can be called complete without a knowledge of that divine book he darted to the bookshelf and came back with a small volume bound in white vellum the hero's soul he explained handing her the volume passes by the laws of metempsychosis into a sofa he is doomed to remain a sofa until such time as two persons consummate upon his bosom their reciprocal and equal loves the book is the record of the poor sofa's hopes and disappointments dear me said rosie looking at the title page but now said mr murkopton sitting down beside her on the edge of crebillon won't you please explain to what happy quid pro quo do i owe this sudden and altogether delightful invasion of my privacy well said rosie and hesitated it was really rather difficult to explain i was to meet a friend of mine quite so said mr murkopton encouragingly who sent me a telegram rosie went on he sent you a telegram mr murkopton echoed changing the the place we had, had fixed and telling me to meet him at this address here rose nodded on the second floor she made it more precise but i live on the second floor said mr murkopton you don't mean to say your friend is also called murkopton and lives here too rosie smiled i don't know what he's called she said with a cool ironical carelessness that was genuinely grande dame you don't know his name 
mr murkopton gave a roar and a squeal of delighted laughter but that's too good he said second floor he wrote in the telegram rosie was now perfectly at her ease when i saw your name i thought it was his name i must say she added looking sideways at mr murkopton and at once dropping the magnolia petals of her eyelids it seemed to me a very charming name you overwhelm me said mr murkopton smiling all over his cheerful snouty face as for your name i am too discreet a galantuomo to ask and in any case what does it matter a rose by any other name but as a matter of fact she said raising and lowering once again her smooth white lids my name does happen to be rose or at any rate rosy so you are sweet by right exclaimed mr murkopton with a pretty gallantry which he was the first to appreciate let's order tea on the strength of it he jumped up and rang the bell how i congratulate myself on this astonishing piece of good fortune rosie said nothing this mr murkopton she thought seemed to be even more a man of the great artistic world than toto what puzzles me he went on is why your anonymous friend should have chosen my address out of all the millions of others he must know me or at any rate know about me i should imagine said rosie that you have a lot of friends mr murkopton laughed the whole orchestra from bassoon to piccolo des amis des amis with and without the mute e he declared the aged and forbidding servant appeared at the door tea for two mrs goldie mrs goldie looked round the room suspiciously the other gentleman's gone has he she asked and having assured herself of his absence she renewed her complaint shoving in like that she said bolshevism that's what i all right all right mrs goldie let's have our tea as quickly as possible mr murkopton held up his hand authoritatively with the gesture of a policeman controlling the traffic very well master pastor mrs goldie spoke with resignation and departed but tell me mr murkopton went on if it isn't indiscreet what does your friend look like oh well rosie answered he's fair and though he is quite young he wears a beard with her two hands she indicated on her own unemphatic bosom the contours of toto's broad blonde fan a beard but good heavens mr murkopton slapped his thigh it's coleman it's obviously and undoubtedly coleman well whoever it was said rosie severely he played a very stupid sort of joke for which i thank him de tout mon coeur rosie smiled and looked sideways all the same she said i shall give him a piece of my mind poor aunt aggie oh poor aunt aggie indeed in the light of mr murkopton's boudoir her hammer copper and her leadless glaze certainly did look a bit comical after tea mr murkopton played cicerone in a tour of inspection round the room they visited the papier mache writing desk the condor fans the marie laurent saint the nineteen fourteen edition of du Côté de chez swann the madonna that probably was a fake the nigger mask the chelsea figures the chinese object of art in sculptured crystal the scale model of queen victoria in wax under a glass bell toto it became clear had been no more than a forerunner the definitive revelation was mr murkopton's yes poor aunt aggie and indeed when mr murkopton began to read her his little middle on the droit du seigneur it was poor everybody poor mother with her absurd old-fashioned prudish views poor earnest father with his unitarianism his hibbert journal his letters to the papers about the necessity for a spiritual regeneration bravo she cried from the depths of crebillon she was leaning back in one corner languid serpentine and at ease her feet in their mottled snake's leather tucked up under her bravo she cried as mr murkopton finished his reading and looked up for his applause 
mr murkupton bowed you express so exquisitely what we and waving her hand in a comprehensive gesture she pictured to herself all the other fastidious ladies all the marchionesses of fable reclining as she herself at this moment reclined on upholstery of white satin what we all only feel and aren't clever enough to say mr murkopton was charmed he got up from before his writing-desk crossed the room and sat down beside her on crebillon feeling he said is the important thing rosie remembered that her father had once remarked in blank verse that things that matter happen in the heart i quite agree she said like movable raisins in the suet of his snouty face mr murkopton's brown little eyes rolled amorous vowels he took rosie's hand and kissed it crebillon creaked discreetly as he moved a little nearer it was only the evening of the same day rosie lay on her sofa a poor higher purchase thing indeed compared with mr murkopton's grand affair in white satin and carved in gilded wood but still a sofa lay with her feet on the arm of it and her long suave legs exposed by the slipping of the kimono to the top of her stretched stockings she was reading the little vellum jacketed volume of crebillon which mr murkopton had given her when he said good-bye or rather a bientot mon ami given not lent as he had less generously offered at the beginning of their afternoon given with the most graceful of elusive dedications inscribed on the fly-leaf two by no other name as sweet with gratitude from crebillon delivered a bientot she had promised to come again very soon she thought of the essay on the jeu primae noctis ah what we've all been feeling and none of us clever enough to say we on the sofas ruthless lovely and fastidious i am proud to constitute myself mr murkopton had said of it l'esprit d'escalier des dames galant rosie was not quite sure what he meant but it certainly sounded very witty indeed she read the book slowly her french indeed wasn't good enough to permit her to read it anyhow else she wished it were better perhaps it if were better she wouldn't be yawning like this it was disgraceful she pulled herself together mr murkopton had said that it was a masterpiece in his study shearwater was trying to write his paper on the regulative functions of the kidneys he was not succeeding why wouldn't she see me yesterday he kept wondering with anguish he suspected other lovers desired her in consequence the more gumbel had said something he remembered that night they had met her by the coffee stall what was it he wished now that he had listened more attentively she's bored with me already it was obvious perhaps he was too rusty for her shearwater looked at his hands yes the nails were dirty he took an orange stick out of his waistcoat pocket and began to clean them he had bought a whole packet of orange sticks that morning determinedly he took up his pen the hydrogen ion concentration in the blood he began a new paragraph but he got no further than the first seven words if he began thinking with a frightful confusion if 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 past conditionals hopelessly past he might have been brought up more elegantly his father for example might have been a barrister instead of a barrister's clerk he mightn't have had to work so hard when he was young might have been about more danced more seen more young women if he had met her years ago during the war should one say dressed in the uniform of a lieutenant in the guards he had pretended that he wasn't interested in women that they had no effect on him that in fact he was above that sort of thing imbecile he might as well have said that he was above having a pair of kidneys he had only consented to admit graciously that they were a physiological necessity oh god what a fool he had been and then what about rosie what sort of a life had she been having while he was being above that sort of thing now he came to think of it he really knew nothing about her except that she had been quite incapable of learning correctly even by heart the simplest facts about the physiology of frogs having found that out he had really given up exploring further how could he have been so stupid 
rosie had been in love with him he supposed had he been in love with her no he had taken care not to be on principle he had married her as a measure of intimate hygiene out of protective affection too certainly out of affection and a little for amusement as one might buy a puppy mrs Vavish had opened his eyes seeing her he had also begun to notice rosie it seemed to him that he had been a loutish cad as well as an imbecile what should he do about it he sat for a long time wondering in the end he decided that the best thing would be to go and tell rosie all about it all about everything about mrs Vavish too yes about mrs Vavish too he would get over mrs Vavish more easily and more rapidly if he did and he would begin to try and find out about rosie he would explore her he would discover all the other things besides an incapacity to learn physiology that were in her he would discover her he would quicken his affection for her into something livelier and more urgent and they would begin again more satisfactorily this time with knowledge and understanding wise from their experience shearwater got up from his chair before the writing-table lurched pensively towards the door bumping into the revolving bookcase and the armchair as he went and walked down the passage to the drawing-room rosie did not turn her head as he came in but went on reading without changing her position her slippered feet still higher than her head her legs still charmingly avowing themselves shearwater came to a halt in front of the empty fireplace he stood there with his back to it as though warming himself before an imaginary flame it was he felt the safest the most strategic point from which to talk what are you reading he asked le sofa said rosie what's that what's that rosie scornfully echoed why it's one of the great french classics who by crebillon the younger never heard of him said sherwater there was a silence rosie went on reading it just occurred to me sherwater began again in his rather ponderous infelicitous way that you mightn't be very happy rosie rosie looked up at him and laughed what put that into your head she asked i'm perfectly happy shearwater was left a little at a loss well i'm very glad to hear it he said i only thought that perhaps you might think that i rather neglected you rosie laughed again what is all this about she said i have it rather on my conscience said shearwater i begin to see something has made me see that i've not i don't treat you very well but i don't no notice it i assure you put in rosie still smiling i leave you out too much shearwater went on with a kind of desperation running his fingers through his thick brown hair we don't share enough together you're too much outside my life but after all said rosie we are a civilized couple we don't want to live in one another's pockets do we no but we're really no more than strangers said shearwater that isn't right and it's my fault i've never tried to get into touch with your life but you did your best to understand mine at the beginning of our marriage oh then said rosie laughing you found out what a little idiot i was don't make a joke of it said shearwater it isn't a joke it's very serious i tell you i've come to see how stupid and inconsiderate and ununderstanding i've been with you i've come to see quite suddenly the fact is he went on with a rush like an uncorked fountain i've been seeing a woman recently whom i like very much and who doesn't like me speaking of mrs Vavish, unconsciously he spoke her language for mrs Vavish, people always euphemistically liked one another rather a lot even when it was a case of the most frightful and excruciating passion the most complete abandonments and somehow that's made me see a lot of things which i've been blind to before fine deliberately i suppose it's made me see among other things that i've really been to blame towards you rosie rosie listened with an astonishment which she perfectly disguised so james was embarking on his little affairs was he it seemed incredible and also as she looked at her husband's face the face behind its bristlingly manly mask of a harassed baby also rather pathetically absurd she wondered who it could be but she displayed no curiosity she would find out soon enough i'm sorry you should have been unhappy about it she said it's finished now shearwater made a decided little gesture ah no said rosie you should persevere she looked at him smiling shearwater was taken aback by this display of easy detachment he had imagined the conversation so very differently as something so serious so painful and at the same time so healing and soothing that he did not know how to go on 
but i thought he said hesitatingly that you that we after this experience i would try to get closer to you oh it sounded ridiculous we might start again from a different place so to speak but cher ami protested rosie with the inflection and in the preferred tongue of mr murkop tom you can't seriously expect us to do the darby and joan business can you you're distressing yourself quite unnecessarily on my account i don't find you neglect me or anything like it you have your life naturally and i have mine we don't get in one another's way but do you think that's the ideal sort of married life asked cheerwater it's obviously the most civilized rosie answered laughing confronted by rosie's civilization cheerwater felt helpless well if you don't want he said i'd hoped i'd thought he went back to his study to think things over the more he thought them over the more he blamed himself and incessantly the memory of mrs lavish tormented him End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of antic hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen after leaving mr murkopton lippiot had gone straight home the bright day seemed to deride him with its shining red omnibuses its parasols its muslin girls its young leaf trees its bands at the street corners it was too much of a garden party to be tolerable he wanted to be alone he took a cab back to the studio he couldn't afford it of course but what did that matter what did that matter now the cab drove slowly and as though with reluctance down the dirty mews he paid it off opened his little door between the wide stable doors climbed the steep ladder of his stairs and was at home he sat down and tried to think death 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 he kept repeating to himself moving his lips as though he were praying if he said the word often enough if he accustomed himself completely to the idea death would come almost by itself he would know it already while he was still alive he would pass almost without noticing out of life into death into death he thought into death death like a well the stone falls falls second after second and at last there is a sound a far-off horrible sound of death and then nothing more the well at carisbrook with a donkey to wind the wheel that pulls up the bucket of water of icy water he thought for a long time of the well of death outside in a muse a barrel organ struck up the tune of where do flies go in the winter time lippia lifted his head to listen he smiled to himself where do flies go the question asked itself with a dramatic a tragical appositeness at the end of everything the last ludicrous touch he sought all from outside he pictured himself sitting there alone broken he looked at his hand lying limp on the table in front of him it needed only the stigma of the nail to make it the hand of a dead christ there he was making literature of it again even now he buried his face in his hands his mind was full of twisted darkness of an unspeakable painful confusion it was too difficult too difficult the ink-pot he found when he wanted to begin writing contained nothing but a parched black sediment he had been meaning for days past to get some more ink and he had always forgotten he would have to write in pencil do you remember he wrote do you remember myra that time we went down into the country you remember under the hog's back at that little inn they were trying to make pretentious hotel bull do you remember how we laughed over the hotel bull and how we liked the country outside its doors all the world in a few square miles chalk pits and blue butterflies on the hog's back 
and at the foot of the hill suddenly the sand the hard yellow sand with those queer caves dug when and by what remote villains at the edge of the pilgrim's way the fine grey sand on which the heather of putnam common grows and the flagstaff and the inscription marking the place where queen victoria stood to look at the view and the enormous sloping meadows round compton and their thick dark woods and the lakes the heaths the scotch firs at cut mill the forests of shackleford there was everything do you remember how we enjoyed it all i did in any case i was happy during those three days and i loved you myra and i thought you might you might perhaps some day love me you didn't and my love has only brought me unhappiness perhaps it has been my fault perhaps i ought to have known how to make you give me happiness you remember that wonderful sonnet of michelangelo's where he says that the loved woman is like a block of marble from which the artist knows how to cut the perfect statue of his dreams if the statue turns out a bad one if it's death instead of love that the lover gets why the fault lies in the artist and in the lover not in the marble not in the beloved arma danque non ha ne tua feltate o fortuna o durezza o gran destino del mio mal colpa o mio destino o sorta se dentro del tuo cor morta e piateti porti in un tempo e ci le mio basso in che no non sapia ardeno trana altro che morte yes it was my basso ingegno my low genius which did not know how to draw love from you nor beauty from the materials of which art is made ah now you'll smile to yourself and say poor casimir he has come to admit that at last yes yes i've come to admit everything that i couldn't paint i couldn't write i couldn't make music that i was a charlatan and a quack that i was a ridiculous actor of heroic parts who deserved to be laughed at and was laughed at but then every man is ludicrous if you look at him from outside without taking into account what's going on in his heart and mind you could turn hamlet into an epigrammatic farce with an inimitable scene when he takes his adored mother in adultery you could make the wittiest guy de maupassant short story out of the life of christ by contrasting the mad rabbi's pretensions with his abject fate it's a question of the point of view every one's a walking farce and a walking tragedy at the same time the man who slips on a banana skin and fractures his skull describes against the sky as he falls the most richly comical arabesque in you myra what do you suppose the unsympathetic gossips say of you what sort of a farce of the boulevards is your life in their eyes for me myra you seem to move all the time through some nameless and incomprehensible tragedy for them you are what merely any sort of a wanton with amusing adventures and what am i a charlatan a quack a pretentious boasting rodomontading imbecile incapable of painting anything but vermouth posters why did that hurt so terribly i don't know there was no reason why you shouldn't think so if you wanted to i was all that and grotesquely laughable and very likely your laughter was justified your judgment was true i don't know i can't tell perhaps i am a charlatan perhaps i'm insincere boasting to others deceiving myself i don't know i tell you everything is confusion in my mind now the whole fabric seems to have tumbled to pieces it lies in a horrible chaos i can make no order within myself have i lied to myself have i acted and postured the great man to persuade myself that i am one have i something in me or nothing have i ever achieved anything of worth anything that rhymed with my conceptions my dreams for those were fine of that i am certain i look into the chaos that is my soul and i tell you i don't know i don't know but what i do know is that i've spent nearly twenty years now playing the charlatan at whom you all laugh that i've suffered in mind and in body too almost from hunger sometimes in order to play it that i've struggled that i've 
exultantly climb to the attack that i've been thrown down ah many times that i've picked myself up and started again well i suppose all that's ludicrous if you like to think of it that way it is ludicrous that a man should put himself to prolonged inconvenience for the sake of something which doesn't really exist at all it's exquisitely comic i can see i can see it in the abstract so to speak but in this particular case you must remember i'm not a dispassionate observer and if i am overcome now it is not with laughter it is with an indescribable unhappiness with the bitterness of death itself death 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 i repeat the word to myself again and again i think of death i try to imagine it i hang over it looking down where the stones fall and fall and there is one horrible noise and then silence again looking down into the well of death it is so deep that there is no glittering eye of water to be seen at the bottom i have no candle to send down it is horrible but i do not want to go on living living would be worse than lippiot was reaching out for another sheet of paper when he was startled to hear the sound of feet on the stairs he turned towards the door his heart beat with violence he was filled with a strange sense of apprehension in terror he awaited the approach of some unknown and terrible being the feet of the angel of death were on the stairs up 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 the piot felt himself trembling as the sound came nearer he knew for certain that in a few seconds he was going to die the hangman had already pinioned him the soldiers of the firing squad had already raised their rifles one two he thought and mrs Davish, standing bareheaded the wind blowing in her hair at the foot of the flagstaff from the side of which queen victoria had admired the distant view of selborne he thought of her dolorously smiling he remembered that once she had taken his head between her two hands and kissed him because you're such a golden ass she had said laughing three there was a little tap at the door the piot pressed his hand over his heart the door opened a small bird-like man with a long sharp nose and eyes as round and black and shining as buttons stepped into the room mr lydgate i presume he began then looked at a card on which a name and address were evidently written lippiot i mean a thousand pardons mr lippiot i presume lippiot leaned back in his chair and shut his eyes his face was as white as paper he breathed hard and his temples were wet with sweat as though he had been running i found the door down below open so i came straight up i hope you'll excuse the stranger smiled apologetically who are you lippiot asked reopening his eyes his heart was still beating hard after the storm it calmed itself slowly he drew back from the brink of the fearful well the time had not yet come to plunge my name said the stranger is boldero herbert boldero our mutual friend mr gumbrell mr theodore gumbrell jr he made it more precise suggested that i might come and see you about a little matter in which he ha and i are interested and in which perhaps you too might be interested the piat nodded without saying anything mr boldero meanwhile was turning his bright bird-like eyes about the studio mrs Vavish's portrait all but finished now was clamped to the easel he approached it a connoisseur it reminds me very much he said of ba casso very much indeed if i may say so also a little of he hesitated trying to think of the name of that other fellow gumbel had talked about but being unable to remember the unimpressive syllables of durin he played for safety and said of or pan mr boldero looked inquiringly at lippiot to see if that was right lippiot still spoke no word and seemed indeed not to have heard what had been said mr boldero saw that it wasn't much good talking about modern art this chap he thought looked as though something were wrong with him he hoped he hadn't got influenza there was a lot of the disease about this little affair i was speaking of he pursued in another tone is a little business proposition that mr gumbel and i have gone into together a matter of pneumatic trousers he waved his hand airily lippiot suddenly burst out laughing and in bitter titan where do flies go where do souls go the barrel organ and now pneumatic trousers then as suddenly he was silent again more literature another piece of acting go on he said i'm sorry not at all not at all said mr boldero indulgently 
i know the idea does seem a little humorous if i may say so at first but i assure you there's money in it mr lydgate mr lippiot money mr boldera paused a moment dramatically well he went on our idea was to launch the new product with a good swinging publicity campaign spend a few thousands in the papers and then get it good and strong into the underground and on the hoardings along with owl bridges and john bull and the golden ballad now for that mr lippiot we shall need as you can well imagine a few good striking pictures mr grimble mentioned your name and suggested i should come and see you to find out if you would perhaps be agreeable to lending us your talent for this work and i may add mr lippiot he spoke with real warmth that having seen this example of your work he pointed to the portrait of mrs lavish i feel that you would be eminently capable of he did not finish the sentence for at this moment lippiot leaped up from his chair and making a shrill inarticulate animal noise rushed on the financier seized him with both hands by the throat shook him threw him to the floor then picked him up again by the coat collar and pushed him towards the door kicking him as he went a final kick sent mr boldere tobogganing down the steep stairs lippiot ran down after him but mr boldere had picked himself up had opened the front door slipped out slammed it behind him and was running up the mews before lippiot could get to the bottom of the stairs lippiot opened the door and looked out mr boldera was already far away almost at the pyrenesian arch he watched him till he was out of sight then went upstairs again and threw himself face downwards on his bed End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of antique Hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty zoe ended the discussion by driving half an inch of penknife into coleman's left arm and running out of the flat slamming the door behind her coleman was used to this sort of thing this sort of thing indeed was what he was there for carefully he pulled out the penknife which had remained sticking in his arm he looked at the blade and was relieved to see that it wasn't so dirty as might have been expected he found some cotton wool mopped up the blood as it oozed out and dabbed the wound with iodine then he set himself to bandage it up but to tie a bandage round one's own left arm is not easy coleman found it impossible to keep the lint in place impossible to get the bandage tight enough at the end of a quarter of an hour he had only succeeded in smearing himself very copiously with blood and the wound was still unbound he gave up the attempt and contented himself with swabbing up the blood as it came out and forthwith came there out blood and water he said aloud and looked at the red stain on the cotton wool he repeated the words again and again and at the fiftieth repetition burst out laughing the bell in the kitchen suddenly buzzed who could it be he went to the front door and opened it on the landing outside stood a tall slender young woman with slanting chinese eyes and a wide mouth elegantly dressed in a black frock piped with white keeping the cotton wool still pressed to his bleeding arm coleman bowed as gracefully as he could do come in he said you are just in the nick of time i'm on the point of bleeding to death and forthwith came there out blood and water enter enter he added seeing the young woman still standing irresolutely on the threshold but i wanted to see mr coleman she said stammering a little and showing her embarrassment by blushing i am mr coleman he took the cotton wool for a moment from his arm and looked with the air of a connoisseur at the blood on it but i shall very soon cease to be that individual unless you come and tie up my wounds but you're not mr coleman i thought you were said the young lady still more embarrassed you have a beard it is true but then i must resign myself to quit this life must i he made a gesture of despair throwing out both hands out out brief coleman out damn spot and he made as though to close the door the young lady checked him if you really need tying up she said i'll do it of course i passed my first aid exam in the war 
coleman reopened the door saved he said come in it had been rosie's original intention yesterday to go straight on from mr murkopton's to toto's she would see him at once she would ask him what he meant by playing that stupid trick on her she would give him a good talking to she would even tell him that she would never see him again but of course if he showed himself sufficiently contrite and reasonably explanatory she would consent or very reluctantly to take him back into favour in the free unprejudiced circles in which she now moved this sort of joke she imagined was a mere trifle it would be absurd to quarrel seriously about it but still she was determined to give toto a lesson when however she did finally leave mr murk upton's delicious boudoir he was too late to think of going all the way to pimlico to the address which mr murk upton had given her she decided to put it off till the next day and so the next day duly she had set out for pimlico to pimlico and to see a man called coleman it seemed rather dull and second-rate after sloane street and mr murk upton poor toto the sparkle of mr murk upton had made him look rather tarnished the essay on the jeu primae noctis ah walking through the unsavoury mazes of pimlico she thought of it and thinking of it smiled poor toto and also she mustn't forget stupid malicious idiotic toto she had made up her mind exactly what she should say to him she had even made up her mind what toto would say to her and when the scene was over they would go and dine at the cafe royale upstairs where she had never been and she would make him rather jealous by telling him how much she had liked mr murkupton but not too jealous silence is golden as her father used to say when she used to fly into tempers and wanted to say nasty things to everybody within range silence about some things is certainly golden in the rather gloomy little turning off lupus street to which she had been directed rosie found the number found in the row of bells and cards the name quickly and decidedly she mounted the stairs well she was going to say as soon as she saw him i thought you were a civilized being mr murkapton had dropped a hint that coleman wasn't really civilized a hint was enough for rosie but i see she would go on that i was mistaken i don't like to associate with bores the fastidious lady had selected him as a young poet not as a ploughboy well rehearsed rosie rang the bell and then the door had opened on this huge bearded cossack of a man who smiled and looked at her with bright dangerous eyes who quoted the bible and it was bleeding like a pig there was blood on his shirt blood on his trousers blood on his hands bloody finger marks on his face even the blond fringe of his beard she noticed was dabbled here and there with blood he was too much at first even for her aristocratic equanimity in the end however she followed him across a little vestibule into a bright whitewashed room empty of all furniture but a table a few chairs and a large box spring and mattress which stood like an island in the middle of the floor and served as bed or sofa as occasion required over the mantelpiece was pinned a large photographic reproduction of leonardo's study of the anatomy of love there were no other pictures on the walls all the apparatus is here said coleman and he pointed to the table lint bandages cotton wool iodine gauze spoiled silk i have them all ready in preparation for these little accidents but do you often manage to cut yourself in the arm asked rosie she took off her gloves and began to undo a fresh packet of lint one gets cut coleman explained little differences of opinion you know if your eye offend you pluck it out love your neighbour as yourself argal if his eye offend you you see we live on christian principles here but who are we asked rosie giving the cut a last dressing of iodine and laying a big square of lint over it merely myself and how shall i put it my helpmate coleman answered ah you're wonderfully skilful at this business he went on you're the real hospital nurse type all maternal instincts when pain and anguish wring the brow an interesting mangle thou as we used to say in the good old days when the pun and the spoonerisms were in fashion rosie laughed oh i don't spend all my time tying up wounds she said 
and turned her eyes for an instant from the bandage after the first surprise she was feeling her cool self again brava cried coleman you make them too do you make them first and cure them afterwards in the grand old homeopathic way delightful you see what leonardo has to say about it with his free hand he pointed to the photograph over the mantelpiece rosie who had noticed the picture when she came into the room preferred not to look at it too closely a second time i think it's rather revolting she said and was very busy with the bandage ah but that's the point that's the whole point said coleman and his clear blue eyes were alive with dancing lights that's the beauty of the grand passion it is revolting you read what the fathers of the church have to say about love here are the men it was odo of cluny wasn't it who called woman a saccus stercoris a bag of muck si quis enum considerat quae intra naris et quae intra focus et quae intra ventrum late ant sordis ubiqua repariat the latin rumbled like eloquent thunder in coleman's mouth et si nec extremis digitus legma vel circus tangeri matirmer quomodo ipsum stercoris sacum am plecti desideramus he smacked his lips magnificent he said i don't understand latin said rosie and i'm glad of it and your bandage is finished look interesting mangle coleman smiled his thanks but bishop odo i fear wouldn't even have spared you not even for your good works still less for your good looks which would only have provoked him to dwell with the more insistency on the visceral secrets which they conceal really rosie protested she would have liked to get up and go away but the cossack's blue eyes glittered at her with such a strange expression and he smiled so enigmatically that she found herself still sitting where she was listening with a disgusted pleasure to his quick talk his screams of deliberate and appalling laughter ah he exclaimed throwing up his hands what sensualists these old fellows were what a real voluptuous feeling they had for dirt and gloom and sordidness and boredom and all the horrors of vice they pretended they were trying to dissuade people from vice by enumerating its horrors but they were really only making it more spicy by telling the truth about it o esca vermium o massa pulveris what nauseating embracements to conjugate the copulative verb boringly and with a sack of tripes what could be more exquisitely and piercingly and deliriously vile and he threw back his head and laughed the blood dappled tips of his blond beard shook rosie looked at them fascinated with disgust there's blood on your beard she felt compelled to say what of it why shouldn't there be coleman asked confused rosie felt herself blushing only because it's rather unpleasant i don't know why but it is what a reason for immediately falling into my arms said coleman to be kissed by a beard is bad enough at any time but by a bloody beard imagine rosie shuddered after all he said what interest or amusement is there in doing the ordinary things in the obvious way life au naturel he shook his head you must have garlic and saffron do you believe in god not m- much said rosie smiling i pity you you must find existence dreadfully dull as soon as you do everything becomes a thousand times life-size phallic symbols five hundred feet high he lifted his hand a row of grinning teeth you could run the hundred yards on he grinned at her through his beard wounds big enough to let a coach and six drive into their purulent recesses every slightest act eternally significant it's only when you believe in god and especially in hell that you can really begin enjoying life for instance when in a few moments you surrender yourself to the importunities of my bloody beard how prodigiously much more you'd enjoy it if you could believe you were committing the sin against the holy ghost if you kept thinking calmly and dispassionately all the time the affair was going on all this is not only a horrible sin it is also ugly grotesque a mere defecation a uh, rosie held up her hand you're really horrible she said coleman smiled at her still she did not go he who is not with me is against me said coleman if you can't make up your mind to be with it's surely better to be positively against than merely negatively indifferent 
nonsense exclaimed rosy feebly when i call my lover a nymphomaniacal dog she runs the penknife into my arm well do you enjoy it asked rosy piercingly he answered it is at once sordid to the last and lowest degree and infinitely and internally significant coleman was silent and rosy too said nothing futilely she wished it had been toto instead of this horrible dangerous cossack mr murkupton ought to have warned her but then of course he supposed that she already knew the creature she looked up at him and found his bright eyes fixed upon her he was silently laughing don't you want to know who i am she asked and how i got here coleman blandly shook his head not in the very least he said rosy felt more helpless somehow than ever why not she asked as bravely and impertinently as she could coleman answered with another question why should i it would be natural curiosity but i know all i want to know he said you are a woman or at any rate you have all the female stigmata not too sumptuously well developed let me add you have no wooden legs you have eyelids that flutter up and down over your eyes like a moving shutter in front of a signalling lamp spelling out in a familiar code the letters a m o r and not unless i am very much mistaken those others c a s t i t a s you have a mouth that looks as though it knew how to taste and how to bite you rosy jumped up i'm going away she said coleman leaned back in his chair and hallooed with laughter bite 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 he said thirty-two times and he opened and shut his mouth as fast as he could so that his teeth clicked against one another with a little dry bony noise every mouthful thirty-two times that's what mr gladstone said and surely mr gladstone he rattled his sharp white teeth again surely mr gladstone should know good-bye said rosy from the door good-bye coleman called back and immediately afterwards jumped to his feet and made a dash across the room towards her rosy uttered a cry slipped through the door and slamming it behind her ran across the vestibule and began fumbling with the latches of the outer door it wouldn't open it wouldn't open she was trembling fear made her feel sick there was a rattling at the door behind her there was a whoop of laughter and then the cossack's hands were on her arms his face came peering over her shoulder and the blond beard dabbled with blood prickled against her neck and face oh don't 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 she implored turning away her head then all at once she began violently crying tears exclaimed coleman in rapture genuine tears he bent eagerly forward to kiss them away to drink them as they fell what an intoxication he said looking up to the ceiling like a chicken that has taken a sip of water he smacked his lips sobbing uncontrollably rosy had never in all her life felt less like a great fastidious lady End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of antique by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one well said grumble here i am again already mrs Bavish had been reduced by the violence of her headache to coming home after her luncheon with piers cotton for a rest she had fed her hungry pain on pyrimidon and now she was lying down on the doofy upholstered sofa at the foot of her full-length portrait by jacques emile blanche her head was not much better but she was bored when the maid had announced grumble she had given word that he was to be let in i'm very ill she went on expiringly look at me she pointed to herself and me again she waved her hand towards the sizzling brilliance of the portrait before and after like the advertisements you know every picture tells a story she laughed faintly then made a little grimace and sucking in the breath between her lips she put her hand to her forehead my poor myra gumbrell pulled up a chair to the sofa and sat there like a doctor at his patient's bedside but before and after what he asked almost professionally mrs Vavish gave an all but imperceptible shrug i don't know she said not influenza i hope no i don't think so not love by any chance mrs Vavish did not venture another laugh she contented herself with smiling agonizingly that would have been a just retribution gumbrell went on after what you've done to me 
what have i done to you mrs Vavish asked opening wide her pale blue eyes merely wrecked my existence but you're being childish theodore say what you mean without these grand silly phrases the dying voice spoke with impatience well what i mean said gumbel is merely this you prevented me from going to see the only person i ever really wanted to see in my life and yesterday when i tried to see her she was gone vanished and here am i left in the vacuum mrs Vavish shut her eyes we're all in the vacuum she said you'll still have plenty of company you know she was silent for a moment still i'm sorry she added why didn't you tell me and why didn't you just pay no attention to me and go all the same i didn't tell you gumbel answered because then i didn't know and i didn't go because i didn't want to quarrel with you thank you said mrs Vavish, and patted his hand but what are you going to do about it now not quarrelling with me is only a rather negative satisfaction i'm afraid i propose to leave the country to-morrow morning said gumbel ah the classical remedy but not to shoot big game i hope she thought of Vavish among the tiki tikis and the tsetses he was a charming creature charming but but what good heavens exclaimed gumbel what do you take me for big game he leaned back in his chair and began to laugh heartily for the first time since he had returned from robert's bridge yesterday evening he had felt then as though he would never laugh again do you see me in a pith helmet with an elephant gun mrs Vavish put her hand to her forehead i see you theodore she said but i tried to think you would look quite normal because of my head i go to paris first said gumbel after that i don't know i shall go wherever i think people will buy pneumatic trousers i'm travelling on business this time in spite of her head mrs Vavish laughed i thought of giving myself a farewell banquet gumbel went on we'll go round before dinner if you're feeling well enough that is and collect a few friends then in profoundest gloom we'll eat and drink and in the morning unshaved exhausted and filled with disgust i shall take the train from victoria feeling thankful to get out of england we'll do it said mrs Vavish faintly and indomitably from the sofa that was almost genuinely a deathbed and meanwhile we'll have a second brew of tea and you shall talk to me the tannin was brought in cumbrel settled down to talk and mrs Vavish to listen to listen and from time to time to dab her brows with eau de cologne to take a sniff of hartshorn cumbrel talked he talked of the marriage ceremonies of octopuses of the rites intricately consummated in the sombrine green grottoes of the indian ocean given a total of sixteen arms how many permutations and combinations of caresses and in the middle of each bunch of arms a mouth like the beak of a macaw on the back side of the moon his friend umbilikoff the mystic used to assure him the souls of the dead in the form of little bladders like so much swelled sago are piled up in piled up till they squash and squeeze one another with an excruciating and ever-growing pressure in the exoteric world this squeezing on the moon's backside is known erroneously as hell and as for the constellation scorpio he was the first of all constellations to have a proper sort of backbone for by an effort of the will he ingurgitated his external armour he compressed and rebuilt it within his body and so became the first vertebrate this you may well believe was a notable day in cosmic history the rents in these new buildings in regent street and piccadilly run to as much as three or four pounds a square foot meanwhile all the beauty imagined by nash has departed and chaos and barbarism once more reign supreme even in regent street the ghost of gumbrel senior stalked across the room who lives longer the man who takes heroin for two years and dies or the man who lives on roast beef water and potatoes till ninety-five one passes his twenty-four months in eternity all the years of the beef-eater are lived only in time i can tell you all about heroin said mrs Vavish. lady capricorn he understood was still keeping open bed how rubens would have admired those silk cushions those gigantic cabbage roses those round pink pearls of hers faster than those that captain nemo discovered in the immemorial oyster 
and the warm dry rustle of flesh over flesh as she walks moving first one leg then advancing the other talking of octopuses the swim bladders of deep-sea fishes are filled with almost absolutely pure oxygen c'est la vie cumbrel shrugged his shoulders in alpine pastures the grasshoppers start their flight whizzing like clockwork grasshoppers and these brown invisible ones reveal themselves suddenly as they skim above the flowers a streak of blue lightning a trailing curve of scarlet then the over wing shuts down over the colored wing below and they are once more invisible fiddlers rubbing their thighs like lady capricorn at the foot of the towering flowers forgers give bettina to their mediaeval ivories by lending them to stout young jewesses to wear for a few months hanging like an amulet between their breasts in italian cemeteries the family vaults are made of glass and iron like greenhouses sir henry griddle has finally married the hog-faced gentlewoman piero della francesca's fresco of the resurrection at saint sepulcro is the most beautiful picture in the world and the whole tale there is far from bad scri abine equals le tchaikovsky de ne jour the dullest landscape painter is marchand the best poet you bore me said mrs Vavish. must i talk of love then asked gumbro it looks like it mrs Vavish answered and closed her eyes Gumbel told the anecdote about joe peters connie astacott and jim baum the anecdote of lola noth and the baroness noman of margarita rada cofani himself and the pastor meyer of lord cavey and little toby nobs when he had finished these he saw that mrs Bavish had gone to sleep he was not flattered but a little sleep would do her headache he reflected a world of good and knowing that if he ceased to speak she would probably be woken by the sudden blankness of the silence he went on quietly talking to himself when i'm abroad this time he soliloquized i shall really begin writing my autobiography there's nothing like a hotel bedroom to work in he scratched his head thoughtfully and even picked his nose which was one of his bad habits when he was alone people who know me he went on will think that what i write about the governess cart and my mother and the flowers and so on is written merely because i know in here he scratched his head a little harder to show himself that he referred to his brain that that's the sort of thing one ought to write about they'll think i'm a sort of dingy romain roland hopelessly trying to pretend that i feel the emotions and have the great spiritual experiences which the really important people do feel and have and perhaps they'll be right perhaps the life of gumbrel will be as manifestly an ersatz as the life of beethoven on the other hand they may be astonished to find that it's the genuine article we shall see gumbrel nodded his head slowly while he transferred two pennies from his right-hand trouser pocket to his left-hand trouser pocket he was somewhat distressed to find that these coppers had been trespassing among the silver silver was for the right hand copper for the left it was one of the laws which it was extremely unlucky to infringe i have a premonition he went on that one of these days i may become a saint an unsuccessful flickering sort of saint like a candle beginning to go out as for love mm, yes mm, yes and as for the people i've met i shall point out that i have known most of the eminent men in europe and that i have said of all of them what i said after my first love affair is that all did you really say that about your first love affair asked mrs Vavish, who had woken up again didn't you no i said this is all everything the universe in love it's either all or nothing at all she shut her eyes and almost immediately went to sleep again gumbrel continued his lullaby soliloquy this charming little book the scotsman this farrago of obscenity slander and false psychology darlington echo mr gumbrel's first cousin is st francis xavier his second cousin is the earl of rochester his third cousin is the man of feeling his fourth cousin is david hume court journal gumbrel was already tired of his joke when i consider how my light is spent he went on when i consider herr jesu as fraulein nimmer nine used to exclaim at the critical moment consider dear cow consider this is not the time of year for grass to grow consider dear cow consider consider 
he got up from his chair and tiptoed across the room to the writing-table an indian dagger lay next to the blotting-pad mrs levice used it as a paper-knife gumbrell picked it up executed several passes with it thumb on the blade he said and strike upwards on guard lunge to the hilt it penetrates poniard at the tip he ran the blade between his fingers caress by the time it reaches the hilt z zip he put down the knife and stopping for a moment to make a grimace set himself in the mirror over the mantelpiece he went back to his chair at seven o'clock mrs vavish woke up she shook her head to feel if the pain were still rolling about loose inside her skull i really believe i'm all right she said she jumped up come on she cried i feel ready for anything and i feel like so much food for worms said gumbrell still where siam atatsa piana il generoso humor he hummed the drinking song out of robert the devil and to that ingenuously jolly melody they left the house their taxi that evening cost them several pounds they made the man drive back and forth like a shuttle from one end of london to the other every time they passed through piccadilly circus mrs vavish leant out of the window to look at the sky signs dancing there unceasing st vitus's dance above the monument of the earl of shaftesbury how i adore them she said the first time they passed them those wheels that whiz round till the sparks fly out from under them that rushing motor and that lovely bottle of port filling the glass and then disappearing and reappearing and filling it again too lovely too revolting gumbrell corrected her these things are the epileptic symbol of all that's most bestial and idiotic in contemporary life look at those beastly things and then look at that he pointed to the county fire office on the northern side of the circus there stands decency dignity beauty repose and there flickers there gibbers and twitches what restlessness distraction refusal to think anything for an unquiet life what a delicious pedant you are she turned away from the window put her hands on his shoulders and looked at him too exquisitely ridiculous and she kissed him you won't force me to change my opinion gumbrell smiled at her Epper si muove i stick to my guns like galileo they move and they're horrible they're me said mrs levice emphatically those things are me they drove first to lipiat's muse under the peronesian arch the clotheslines looped from window to window across the street might have been those ropes which form so essential and so mysterious a part of the furniture of the prisons the place smelt the children were shouting the hyena-like laughter of the flappers reverberated between the close-set walls all gumbrell's sense of social responsibility was aroused in a moment shut up in his room all day lippiat had been writing writing his whole life all his ideas and ideals all for myra the pile of scribbled sheets grew higher and higher towards evening he made an end he had written all that he wanted to write he ate the remains of yesterday's loaf of bread and drank some water for he realized suddenly that he had been fasting the whole day then he composed himself to think he stretched himself out on the brink of the well and looked down into the eyeless darkness he still had his service revolver taking it out of the drawer in which it was kept he loaded it he laid it on the packing-case which served him as a table at his bed's head and stretched himself out on the bed he lay quite still his muscles all relaxed hardly breathing he imagined himself dead derision there was still the plunge into the well he picked up the pistol looked down the barrel black and deep as the well the muzzle against his forehead was a cold mouth there was nothing new to be thought about death there was not even the possibility of a new thought only the old thoughts the horrible old questions returned the cold mouth to his forehead his finger pressing on the trigger already he would be falling falling and the annihilating crash would be the same as the faraway sound of death at the bottom of the well and after that in the silence the old question was still the same after that he would lie bleeding the flies would drink his blood as though it were red honey in the end the people would come and fetch him away and the coroner's jury would look at him in the mortuary and pronounce him temporarily insane then he would be buried in a black hole would be buried and decay and meanwhile would there be anything else there was nothing new to be thought or asked and there was still no answer in the room it began to grow dark colours vanished forms ran together the easel and myra's portrait were now a single black silhouette against the window 
near and far refused become one and continuous in the darkness became a part of the darkness outside the window the pale twilight grew more sombre the children shouted shrilly playing their games under the green gas lamps the mirthless ferocious laughter of young girls mocked and invited lippiot stretched out his hand and fingered the pistol down below at his door he heard a sharp knocking he lifted his head and listened caught the sound of two voices a man's and a woman's myra's voice he recognized at once the other he supposed was gumbrell's hideous to think that people actually live in places like this gumbrell was saying look at those children it ought to be punishable by law to produce children in this street they always take me for the pied piper said mrs vavish lippiot got up and crept to the window he could hear all they said i wonder if lippiot's in i don't see any sign of a light but he has heavy curtains said mrs vavish and i know for a fact that he always composes his poetry in the dark he may be composing poetry gumbrell laughed knock again said mrs vavish poets are always absorbed you know and casimir's always the poet il poeta capital p like d'annunzio in the italian papers said gumbrell did you know that d'annunzio has books printed on mackintosh for his bath he rapped again at the door i saw it in the correri della sera the other day at the club he reads the little flowers of st francis by preference in his bath and he has a fountain pen with waterproof ink in the soap dish so that he can add a few fioretti of his own whenever he feels like it we might suggest that to casimir lippiot stood with folded arms by the window listening how lightly they threw his life his heart from hand to hand as though it were a ball and they were playing a game he thought suddenly of all the times he had spoken lightly and maliciously of other people his own person had always seemed on those occasions sacred one knew in theory very well that others spoke of one contemptuously as one spoke of them in practice it was hard to believe poor casimir said mrs Vavish, i'm afraid his show was a failure i know it was said gumbrell complete and absolute i told my tame capitalist that he ought to employ lippiot for our advertisements he'd be excellent for those and it would mean some genuine money in his pocket but the worst of it is said mrs Vavish, that he'll only feel insulted by the suggestion she looked up at the window i don't know why she went on this house looks most horribly dead i hope nothing's happened to poor casimir i've a most disagreeable feeling that it may have ah this famous feminine intuition laughed gumbrell he knocked again i can't help feeling that he may be lying there dead or delirious or something and i can't help feeling that he must have gone out to dinner we shall have to give him up i'm afraid it's a pity he's so good with Merkopton, like bear and mastiff or rather like bear and poodle bear and king charles's spaniel or whatever those little dogs are that you see ladies in eighteenth-century french engravings taking to bed with them let's go just knock once again said mrs Vavish. he might really be preoccupied or asleep or ill gumbel knocked now listen hush they were silent the children still went on hallooing in the distance there was a great clop clopping of horses feet as a van was backed into a stable door near by lippiot stood motionless his arms still crossed his chin on his breast the seconds passed not a sound said gumbrell he must have gone out i suppose so said mrs Vavish. come on then we'll go and look for Murkopton. he heard their steps in the street below heard the slamming of the taxi door the engine was started up loud on the first gear less loud on the second whisperingly on the third it moved away gathering speed the noise of it was merged with the general noise of the town they were gone lippiot walked slowly back to his bed he wished suddenly that he had gone down to answer the last knock these voices at the well's edge he had turned to listen to them at the well's extreme verge he lay quite still in the darkness and it seemed to him at last that he had floated away from the earth that he was alone no longer in a narrow dark room but in an illimitable darkness outside and beyond his mind grew calmer he began to think of himself of all that he had known remotely as though from a great way off adorable lights said mrs Vavish, as they drove once more through piccadilly circus grumble said nothing he had said all that he had to say last time and there's another exclaimed mrs Vavish, as they passed near burlington house a fountain of sandemans port 
if only they had an automatic jazz band attached to the same mechanism she said regretfully the green park remained solitary and remote under the moon wasted on us said gumbel as they passed one should be happily in love to enjoy a summer night under the trees he wondered where emily could be now they sat in silence the cab drove on mr murkopton it seemed had left london his housekeeper had a long story to tell a regular bolshevik had come yesterday pushing in and she had heard him shouting at mr murkopton in his own room and then luckily a lady had come and the bolshevik had gone away again and this morning mr murkopton had decided quite sudden like to go away for two or three days and it wouldn't surprise her at all if it had something to do with that horrible bolshevik fellow though of course master pastor hadn't said anything about it still as she'd known him when he was so high and seen him grow up like she thought she could say she knew him well enough to guess why he did things it was only brutally that they contrived to tear themselves away secure meanwhile behind a whole troop of butlers and footmen mr murkopton was dining comfortably at oxanger with the most faithful of his friends and admirers mrs spiegel it was to mrs spiegel that he had dedicated his coruscating little loves of the pachyderms for mrs spiegel it was who had suggested casually one day at luncheon that the human race ought to be classified in two main species the pachyderms and those whose skin like her own like mr murkopton's and a few others was fine and responsive and mr murkopton himself put it to all caresses including those of pure reason mr murkopton had taken the casual hint and had developed it richly the barbarous pachyderms he divided up into a number of subspecies stetocephali acephali theolators industrious judarinki busy compact and hard as dung beetles peabodies russians and so on it was all very witty and delicately savage mr murkoptan had a standing invitation at oxanger with dangerous pachyderms like lipiot ranging loose about the town he thought it best to avail himself of it mrs spiegel he knew would be delighted to see him and indeed she was he arrived just at lunchtime mrs spiegel and maisie furlonger were already at the fish her captain mrs spiegel's soul seemed to be in the name sit down she went on cooing as she talked like a ring dove there seemed to be singing in every word she spoke she pointed to a chair next to hers now you're in just in time to tell us all about near lesbian experiences and murkopton giving vent to his fully orchestrated laugh squeal and roar together had sat down and speaking in french partly he nodded towards the butler and the footman a cause des valets and partly because the language lent itself more deliciously to this kind of confidences he had begun there and then interrupted and spurred on by the cooing of mrs spiegel and the happy shrieks of maisie furlonger to recount at length and with all the wit in the world his experience among the isles of greece how delicious it was he said to himself to be with really civilized people in this happy house it seemed scarcely possible to believe that such a thing as a pachyderm existed but lippiat still lay face upwards on his bed floating it seemed to himself far out into the dark emptinesses between the stars from those distant abstract spaces he seemed to be looking impersonally down upon his own body stretched out by the brink of the hideous well to be looking back over his own history everything even his own unhappiness seemed very small and beautiful every frightful convulsion had become no more than a ripple and only the fine musical ghost of sound came up to him from all the shouting we have no luck said gumbel as they climbed once more into the cab i'm not sure said mrs vavish that we haven't really had a great deal did you generally want very much to see murkopton not in the least said gumbel but do you genuinely want to see me mrs vavish drew the corners of her mouth down into a painful smile and did not answer aren't we going to pass through piccadilly circus again she asked i should like to see the lights again they give one temporarily the illusion of being cheerful no no said gumbel we are going straight to victoria we couldn't tell the driver to certainly not ah well said mrs vavish perhaps one's better without stimulants i remember when i was very young when i first began to go about at all how proud i was of having discovered champagne it seemed to me wonderful to get rather tipsy something to be exceedingly proud of and at the same time how much i really disliked wine 
loathed the taste of it sometimes when calliope and i used to dine quietly together tete-a-tete with no awful men about and no appearances to keep up we used to treat ourselves to the luxury of a large lemon squash or even raspberry syrup and soda i wish i could recapture the deliciousness of raspberry syrup coleman was at home after a brief delay he appeared himself at the door he was wearing pyjamas and his face was covered with red-brown smears the tips of his beard were clotted with the same dried pigment what have you been doing to yourself asked mrs Vavish. merely washing in the blood of the lamb coleman answered smiling and his eyes sparkling blue fire like an electric machine the door on the opposite side of the little vestibule was open looking over coleman's shoulder cumberland could see through the opening a brightly lighted room and in the middle of it like a large rectangular island a wide divan reclining on the divan an odalisk by angra but slimmer more serpentine more like a lithe pink length of boa presented her back that big brown mole on the right shoulder was surely familiar but when startled by the loudness of the voices behind her the odalisk turned round to see in a horribly embarrassing instant that the cossack had left the door open and that people could look in were looking in indeed the slanting eyes beneath their heavy white lids the fine aquiline nose the wide full-lipped mouth though they presented themselves for only the fraction of a second was still more recognizable and familiar for only the fraction of a second did the odalisk reveal herself definitely as rosy then a hand pulled feverishly at the counterpane the section of buff-coloured boa wrinkled and rolled and in a moment where an odalisque had been lay only a long packet under a white sheet like a jockey with a fractured skull when they carry him from the course where really gumbrell felt positively indignant not jealous but astonished and righteously indignant well when you've finished bathing said mrs Vavish. i hope you'll come and have dinner with us coleman was standing between her and the farther door mrs Vavish had seen nothing in the room beyond the vestibule i'm busy said coleman so i see gumbrell spoke as sarcastically as he could do you see asked coleman and looked round so you do he stepped back and closed the door it's theodore's last dinner pleaded mrs Vavish not even if it were his last supper said coleman enchanted to have been given the opportunity to blaspheme a little is he going to be crucified or what merely going abroad said gumbrell he has a broken heart mrs Vavish explained ah the genuine platonic trousers coleman uttered his artificial demon's laugh that's just about it said gumbrell grimly relieved by the shutting of the door from her immediate embarrassment rosie threw back a corner of the counterpane and extruded her head one arm and the shoulder with the mole on it she looked about her opening her slanting eyes as wide as she could she listened with parted lips to the voices that came muffled now through the door it seemed to her as though she were waking up as though now for the first time she were hearing that shattering laugh were looking now for the first time on these blank white walls and the one lovely and horrifying picture where was she what did it all mean rosie put her hand to her forehead tried to think her thinking was always a series of pictures one after another the pictures swam up before her eyes melted again in an instant her mother taking off her pince-nez to wipe them and at once her eyes were tremulous and vague and helpless you should always let the gentleman get over the stile first she said and put on her glasses again beyond the glasses her eyes immediately became clear piercing steady and efficient rather formidable eyes they had seen rosie getting over the stile in front of willie hoskins and there was too much leg james reading at his desk his heavy round head propped on his hand she came up behind him and threw her arms round his neck very gently and without turning his eyes from the page he undid her embrace and with a little push that was no more than a hint an implication signified that he didn't want her she had gone to her pink room and cried another time james shook his head and smiled patiently under his moustache you'll never learn he said she had gone to her room and cried that time too another time they were lying in bed together in the pink bed only you couldn't see it was pink because there was no light they were lying very quietly warm and happy and remote she felt sometimes as it were the physical memory of pleasure plucked at her nerves making her start making her suddenly shiver james was breathing as though he were asleep 
all at once he stirred he patted her shoulder two or three times in a kindly and business-like way i know what that means she said when you pat me like that and she patted him pat 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 very quickly it means you're going to bed how do you know he asked do you think i don't know you after all this time i know that pat by heart and suddenly all her warm quiet happiness evaporated it was all gone i'm only a machine for going to bed with she said that's all i am for you she felt she would like to cry but james only laughed and said nonsense and pulled his arm clumsily from underneath her you go to sleep he said and kissed her on the forehead then he got out of bed and she heard him bumping clumsily about in the darkness damn he said once then he found the door opened and was gone she thought of those long stories she used to make up when she went shopping the fastidious lady the poets all the adventures toto's hands were wonderful she saw she heard mr murkopton reading his essay poor father reading aloud from the hibbert journal and now the cossack covered with blood he too might read aloud from the hibbert journal only backwards so to speak she had a bruise on her arm you think there's nothing inherently wrong and disgusting in it he had asked there is i tell you he had laughed and kissed her and stripped off her clothes and caressed her and she had cried she had struggled she had tried to turn away and in the end she had been overcome by a pleasure more piercing and agonizing than anything she had ever felt before and all the time coleman had hung over her with his blood-stained beard smiling into her face and whispering horrible horrible infamous and shameful she lay in a kind of stupor then suddenly there had been that ringing the cossack had left her and now she was awake again and it was horrible it was shameful she shuddered she jumped out of bed and began as quickly as she could to put on her clothes really really won't you come mrs Ravish was insisting she was not used to people saying no when she asked when she insisted she didn't like it no coleman shook his head you may be having the last supper but i have a date here with the magdalen oh a woman said Ravish. but why didn't you say so before well as i'd left the door open said coleman i thought it was unnecessary fie said mrs Ravish. i find this very repulsive let's go away she plucked cumbrel by the sleeve good-bye said coleman politely he shut the door after them and turned back across the little hall what not thinking of going he exclaimed as he came in rosie was sitting down on the edge of the bed pulling on her shoes go away she said you disgust me but that's splendid coleman declared that's all as it should be all as i intended he sat down beside her on the divan really he said admiringly what exquisite legs rosie would have given anything in the world to be back again in bluxom gardens even if james did live in his books all the time anything in the world this time said mrs Lavish, we simply must go through piccadilly circus it'll only be about two miles farther well that isn't much cumbrell leaned out and gave the word to the driver and besides i like driving about like this said mrs Lavish. i like driving for driving's sake it's like the last ride together dear theodore she laid her hand on his thank you said gumbrell and kissed it the little cab buzzed along down the empty mall they were silent through the thick air one could see the brightest of the stars it was one of those evenings when men feel that truth goodness and beauty are one in the morning when they commit their discovery to paper when others read it written there it looks wholly ridiculous it was one of those evenings when love is once more invented for the first time that too seems a little ridiculous sometimes in the morning here are the lights again said mrs Lavish. hop which flick yes genuinely an illusion of jollity theodore genuinely cumbrell stopped the cab it's after half-past eight he said at this rate we shall never get anything to eat wait a minute he ran into abenrotz and came back in a moment with a packet of smoked salmon sandwiches a bottle of white wine and a glass we have a long way to go he explained as he got into the taxi they ate their sandwiches they drank their wine the taxi drove on and on this is positively exhilarating said mrs Vavish, as they turned into the edgware road polished by the wheels and shining like an old and precious bronze the road stretched before them reflecting the lamps it had the inviting air of a road which goes on for ever 
they used to have such good peep shows in the street gumbrel tenderly remembered little back shops where you paid tuppence to see the genuine mermaid which turned out to be a stuffed walrus and the tattooed lady and the dwarf and the living statuary which one always hoped as a boy was really going to be rather naked and thrilling but which was always the most pathetic of unemployed barmaids dressed in the thickest of pink jager do you think there'd be any of those now asked mrs Bavish. gumbrel shook his head they've moved on with the march of civilization but where he spread out his hands interrogatively i don't know which direction civilization marches where the north towards kilburn and golders green or over the river to the elephant to clapham and sindham and all those other mysterious places but in any case high rents have marched up here there are no more genuine mermaids than the edgware road what stories we shall be able to tell our children do you think we shall ever have any mrs Lavish asked one can never tell i should have thought one could said mrs Lavish. children that would be the most desperate experiment of all the most desperate and perhaps the only one having any chance of being successful history recorded cases on the other hand it recorded other cases that proved the opposite she had often thought of this experiment there were so many obvious reasons for not making it but some day perhaps she always put it off like that the cab had turned off the main road into quieter and darker streets where are we now asked mrs Lavish, penetrating into maida vale we shall soon be there poor old shearwater he laughed other people in love were always absurd shall we find him in i wonder it would be fun to see shearwater again she liked to hear him talking learnedly and like a child for when the child is six feet high and three feet wide and two feet thick when it tries to plunge head first into your life then really no but what did you want with me he had asked just to look at you she answered just to look that was all music hall not boudoir here we are gumbrel got out and rang the second floor bell the door was opened by an impertinent-looking little maid mr shearwater's at the lavatory she said in answer to gumbrel's question laboratory he suggested at the hospital that made it clear and is mrs shearwater at home he asked maliciously the little maid shook her head i expected her but she didn't come back to dinner would you mind giving her a message when she does come in said gumbrel tell her that mr toto was very sorry he hadn't had time to speak to her when he saw her this evening in pimlico mr who mr toto mr toto is sorry e adn't the time to speak to mrs sherwater when e saw er in pimlico this evening very well sir you won't forget said gumbrel no i won't forget he went back to the cab and explained that they had drawn blank once more i'm rather glad said mrs Vavish. if we ever did find anybody it would mean the end of this last ride together feeling and that would be sad and it's a lovely night and really for the moment i feel i can do without my lights suppose we just drove for a bit now but gumbrel would not allow that we haven't had enough to eat yet he said and he gave the cabin gumbrel senior's address gumbrel senior was sitting on his little iron balcony among the dried-out pots that had once held geraniums smoking his pipe and looking earnestly out into the darkness in front of him clustered in the fourteen plane trees of the square the starlings were already asleep there was no sound but the rustling of the leaves but sometimes every hour or so the birds would wake up something perhaps it might be a stronger gust of wind perhaps some happy dream of worms some nightmare of cats simultaneously dreamed by all the flock together would suddenly rouse them and then they would all start to talk at once at the tops of their shrill voices for perhaps half a minute then in an instant they all went to sleep again and there was once more no sound but the rustling of the shaken leaves at these moments mr gumbrel would lean forward would strain his eyes and his ears in the hopes of seeing of hearing something something significant explanatory satisfying he never did of course but that in no way diminished his happiness mr gumbrel received them on his balcony with courtesy i was just thinking of going in to work he said and now you come and give me a good excuse for sitting out here a little longer i am delighted gumbrel jr went downstairs to see what he could find in the way of food while he was gone his father explained to mrs Bavish the secrets of the birds enthusiastically his light floss of grey hair floating up and falling again about his head as he 
pointed and gesticulated he told her the great flocks assembled goodness only knew where they flew across the golden sky detaching here a little troop there a whole legion they flew until at last all had found their appointed resting-places and there were no more to fly he made his nightly flight sounds epical as though it were a migration of peoples a passage of armies and it's my firm belief said gumbel senior adding notes to his epic that they make use of some sort of telepathy some kind of direct mind-to-mind -mind communication between themselves you can't watch them without coming to that conclusion a charming conclusion said mrs Vavish. it's a faculty gumbel senior went on we all possess i believe all we animals he made a gesture which included himself mrs Vavish, and the invisible birds among the plain trees why don't we use it more you may well ask for the simple reason my dear young lady that half our existence is spent in dealing with things that have no mind things with which it is impossible to hold telepathic communication hence the development of the five senses i advise that preserve me from running into the lamp-post ears that warn me i am in the neighbourhood of niagara and having made these instruments very efficient i use them even in holding converse with other beings having a mind i let my telepathic faculty lie idle preferring to employ an elaborate and cumbrous arrangement of symbols in order to make my thought known to you through your senses in certain individuals however the faculty is naturally so well developed like the musical or the mathematical or the chess-playing faculties in other people that they cannot help entering into direct communication with other minds whether they want to or not if we knew a good method of educating and drawing out the latent faculty most of us could make ourselves moderately efficient telepaths just as most of us can make ourselves into moderate musicians chess players and mathematicians there would also be a few no doubt who could never communicate directly just as there are a few who cannot recognize rule britannia or box concerto and deep minor for two violins and a few who cannot comprehend the nature of an algebraical symbol look at the general development of the mathematical and musical faculties only within the last two hundred years by the twenty-first century i believe we shall all be telepaths meanwhile these delightful birds have forestalled us not having the wit to invent a language or an expressive pantomime they contrive to communicate such simple thoughts as they have directly and instantaneously they all go to sleep at once wake at once say the same thing at once they turn all at once when they are flying without a leader without a word of command they do everything together in complete unison sitting here in the evenings i sometimes fancy i can feel their thoughts striking against my own it has happened to me once or twice that i have known a second before it actually happened that the birds were going to wake up and begin their half minute of chatter in the dark wait hush gumbrel senior drew back his head pressed his hand over his mouth as though by commanding silence on himself he could command it on the whole world i believe they are going to wake now i feel it he was silent mrs Vavish looked towards the dark trees and listened a full minute passed then the old gentleman burst out happily laughing completely wrong he said they've never been more soundly asleep mrs Vavish laughed too perhaps they all changed their minds just as they were waking up she suggested grumble junior reappeared glasses clinked as he walked and there was a little rattle of crockery he was carrying a tray cold beef he said and salad and a bit of cold apple pie it might be worse they drew up chairs to grumble senior's work-table and there among the letters and the unpaid bills and the sketchy elevations of our caducal palaces they ate the beef and the apple pie and drank the one and ninepenny vin ordinaire of the house grumble senior who had already supped looked on at them from the balcony did i tell you said gumbel junior that we saw mr porteous's son the other evening very drunk gumbel senior threw up his hands if you knew the calamities that young imbecile has been the cause of what's he done gambled away i don't know how much borrowed money and poor porteous can't afford anything even now mr grumble shook his head and clutched and combed his beard it's a fearful blow but of course porteous is very steadfast and serene and there gumbrel senior interrupted himself holding up his hand listen in the fourteen plain trees the starlings had suddenly woken up there was a wild outburst like a stormy sitting in the italian parliament then all was silent gumbrel senior listened enchanted his face as he turned back towards the light revealed itself all smiles his hair seemed to have blown loose of its own accord from within so to speak he pushed it into place you heard them he asked mrs Vavish. 
what can they have to say to one another i wonder at this time of night and did you feel they were going to wake up mrs levish inquired no said gumbrel senior with candour when we finished gumbrel junior spoke with his mouth full you must show myra your model of london she'd adore it except that it has no electric sky signs his father looked all of a sudden very much embarrassed i don't think it would interest mrs levish much he said oh yes it would really she declared well as a matter of fact it isn't here gumbrel senior pulled with fury at his beard not here but what's happened to it gumbrel senior wouldn't explain he just ignored his son's question and began to talk once more about the starlings later on however when gumbrel and mrs levish were preparing to go the old man drew him apart into a corner and began to whisper the explanation i didn't want to blare it about in front of strangers he said as though it were a question of the housemaid's illegitimate baby or a repair of the water-closet but the fact is i've sold it the victoria and albert had wind that i was making it they'd been wanting it all the time and i've let them have it but why gumbrel jr asked in a tone of astonishment he knew with what a paternal affection no more than paternal for he was sure that his father was more whole-heartedly attached to his models than his son with what pride he regarded these children of his spirit gumbrel senior sighed it's all that young imbecile he said what young imbecile porteus's son of course you see poor porteus has had to sell his library among other things you don't know what that means to him all these precious books and collected at the price of such hardships i thought i'd like to buy a few of the best ones back for him they gave me quite a good price at the museum he came out of his corner and hurried across the room to help mrs levish with her cloak allow me allow me he said slowly and pensively gumbel jr followed him beyond good and evil below good and evil the name of earwig the tubby pony trotted the wild columbines suspended among the shadows of the hazel copse hooked spurs helmets of aerial purple the twelfth sonata of mozart was insecticide no earwigs could crawl through that music emily's breasts were firm and pointed and she had slept at last without a tremor in the starlight good true and beautiful became one write the discovery in books in books quos in the morning legimus cacantus they descended the stairs the cab was waiting outside the last ride again said mrs Levish golgotha hospital southwark said gumbel to the driver and follow her into the cab drive 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 repeated mrs Levish. i like your father theodore one of these days he'll fly away with the birds and how nice it is of those darlings to wake themselves up like that in the middle of the night merely to amuse him considering how unpleasant it is to be woken in the night where are we going we're going to look at shearwater in his laboratory is that a long way away immensely said gumbel thank god for that said mrs levish piously and expiringly breathed end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of antique hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two shearwater sat on his stationary bicycle pedalling unceasingly like a man in a nightmare the pedals were geared to a little wheel under the saddle and the rim of the wheel rubbed as it revolved against a brake carefully adjusted to make the work of the pedlar hard but not impossibly hard from a pipe which came up through the floor issued a little jet of water which played on the brake and kept it cool but no jet of water played on sheer water it was his business to get hot he did get hot from time to time his dog-faced young friend lansing came and looked through the window of the experimenting chamber to see how he was getting on inside that little wooden house which might have reminded lansing if he had had a literary turn of mind of the box in which gulliver left rob dignag the scenes of intimate life were the same every time he looked in shearwater was always at his post on the saddle of the nightmare bicycle pedalling pedalling the water trickled over the brake and shearwater sweated great drops of sweat came oozing out from under his hair 
ran down over his forehead hung beaded on his eyebrows ran into his eyes down his nose along his cheeks fell like raindrops his thick bull neck was wet his whole naked body his arms and legs streamed and shone the sweat poured off him and was caught as it rained down in a waterproof sheet to trickle down its sloping folds into a large glass receptacle which stood under a hole in the centre of the sheet at the focal point where all its slopes converged the automatically controlled heating apparatus in the basement kept the temperature in the box high and steady peering through the damp dimmed panes of the window lansing noticed with satisfaction that the mercury stood unchangingly at twenty seven point five centigrade the ventilators at the side and top of the box were open sheer water had air enough another time lansing reflected they'd make the box airtight and see the effect of a little carbon dioxide poisoning on top of excessive sweating it might be very interesting but to-day they were concerned with sweating only after seeing that the thermometer was steady that the ventilators were properly open the water was still trickling over the break lansing would tap at the window and shearwater who kept his eyes fixed straight before him as he pedalled slowly and unremittingly along his nightmare road would turn his head at the sound all right lansing's lips moved and his eyebrows went up inquiringly shearwater would nod his big round head and the sweat drops suspended on his eyebrows and his moustache would fall like little liquid fruits shaken suddenly by the wind good and lansing would go back to his thick german book under the reading lamp at the other end of the laboratory constant as the thermometer shearwater pedalled steadily and slowly on with a few brief halts for food and rest he had been pedalling ever since lunch-time at eleven he would go to bed on a shakedown in the laboratory and at nine to-morrow morning he would re-enter the box and start pedalling again he would go on all to-morrow and the day after and after that as long as he could stand it one two three four pedal 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 he must have travelled the equivalent of sixty or seventy miles this afternoon he would be getting on for swindon he would be nearly at portsmouth he would be past cambridge past oxford he would be nearly at harwich pedalling through the green and golden valleys where constable used to paint he would be at winchester by the bright stream he would have ridden through the beech woods of arundel out into the sea in any case he was far away he was escaping and mrs vavish followed walking swayingly along on feet that seemed to tread between two abysses at her leisure pedal pedal the hydrogen ion concentration in the blood formidably calmly her eyes regarded the lids cut off an arc of those pale circles when she smiled it was a crucifixion the coils of her hair were copper serpents her small gestures loosened enormous fragments of the universe and at the faint dying sound of her voice they had fallen in ruins about him his world was no longer safe it had ceased to stand on its foundations mrs vavish walked among his ruins and did not even notice them he must build up again pedal pedal he was not merely escaping he was working a building machine it must be built with proportion with proportion the old man had said the old man appeared in the middle of the nightmare road in front of him clutching his beard proportion proportion there were first a lot of dirty rocks lying about then there was st paul's these bits of his life had to be built up proportionably there was work and there was talk about work and ideas and there were men who could talk about work and ideas but so far as he had been concerned that was about all they could do he would have to find out what else they did it was interesting and he would have to find out what other men did 
men who couldn't talk about work and not much about ideas they had as good kidneys as any one else and then there were women on the nightmare road he remained stationary the pedals went round and round under his driving feet the sweat ran off him he was escaping and yet he was also drawing nearer he would have to draw nearer woman what have i to do with you not enough too much not enough he was building her in a great pillar next to the pillar of work too much he was escaping if he had not caged himself here in this hot box he would have run out after her to throw himself all in fragments all dissipated and useless in front of her and she wanted none of him but perhaps it would be worse perhaps it would be far far worse if she did the old man stood in the road before him clutching his beard crying out proportion proportion he trod and trod at his building machine working up the pieces of his life steadily unremittingly working them into a proportionable whole into a dome that should hang light spacious and high as though by a miracle on the empty air he trod and trod escaping mile after mile into fatigue into wisdom he was at dover now peddling across the channel he was crossing a dividing gulf and there would be safety on the other side the cliffs of dover were already behind him he turned his head as though to look back at them the drops of sweat were shaken from his eyebrows from the shaggy fringes of his moustache he turned his head from the blank wooden wall in front of him over his left shoulder a face was looking through the observation window behind him a woman's face it was the face of mrs Vavish. shearwater uttered a cry and had once turned back again he redoubled his peddling one two three four furiously he rushed along the nightmare road she was haunting him now in hallucinations she was pursuing and she was gaining on him will wisdom resolution and understanding were of no avail then but there was always fatigue the sweat poured down his face streamed down the indented runnel of his spine along the seam at the meeting place of the ribs his loincloth was wringing wet the drops pattered continuously on the waterproof sheet his calves and the muscles of his thighs ached with peddling one two three four he trod round a hundred times with either foot after that he ventured to turn his head once more he was relieved and at the same time he was disappointed to see that there was now no face at the window he had exercised the hallucination he settled down to a more leisurely peddling in the annex of the laboratory the animals devoted to the service of physiology were woken by the sudden opening of the door the sudden eruption of light the albino guinea pigs peered through the meshes of their hutch and their red eyes were like the rear lights of bicycles the pregnant she rapids lolloped out and shook their ears and pointed their tremulous noses towards the door the cock into which shearwater had engrafted an ovary came out not knowing whether to crow or cluck when he is with hens lansing explained to his visitors he thinks he's a cock when he's with a cock he's convinced he's a pullet the rats who were being fed on milk from a london dairy came tumbling from their nest with an anxious hungry squeaking they were getting thinner and thinner every day in a few days they would be dead but the old rat whose diet was grade a milk from the country hardly took the trouble to move he was as fat and sleek as a brown furry fruit ripe to bursting no skim and chalky water no dry dung and tubercle bacilli for him he was in clover next week however the fates were plotting to give him diabetes artificially in their glass pagoda the little black the axolotls crawled the heraldry of mexico among a scanty herbage the beetles who had had their heads cut off and replaced by the heads of other beetles darted uncertainly about some obeying their heads some their genital organs a fifteen-year-old monkey rejuvenated by the steinic process was discovered by the light of lansing's electric torch shaking the bars that separated him from the green-furred bald-rumped bearded young beauty in the next cage 
he was gnashing his teeth with thwarted passion lansing expounded to the visitors all the secrets the vast unbelievable fantastic world opened out as he spoke there were tropics there were cold seas busy with living beings there were forests full of horrible trees silence and darkness there were ferments and infinitesimal poisons floating in the air there were leviathans suckling their young there were flies and worms there were men living in cities thinking knowing good and evil and all were changing continuously moment by moment and each remained all the time itself by virtue of some unimaginable enchantment they were all alive and on the other side of the courtyard beyond the shed in which the animals slept or uneasily stirred in the huge hospital that went up sheer like a windowed cliff into the air men and women were ceasing to be themselves or were struggling to remain themselves they were dying they were struggling to live the other windows looked on to the river the lights of london bridge were on the right a blackfriars to the left on the opposite shore st paul's floated up as though self-supported in the moonlight like time the river flowed silent and black gumbrell and mrs vaviche leaned their elbows on the sill and looked out like time the river flowed stanchlessly as though from a wound in the world's side for a long time they were silent they looked out without speaking across the floor of time at the stars at the human symbol hanging miraculously in the moonlight lansing had gone back to his german book he had no time to waste looking out of windows to-morrow said gumbrell at last meditatively to-morrow mrs vaviche interrupted him will be as awful as to-day she breathed it like a truth from beyond the grave prematurely revealed expiringly from her deathbed within come come protested gumbrell in his hot box sheer water sweated and pedalled he was across the channel now he felt himself safe still he trod on he would be at amiens by midnight if he went on at this rate he was escaping he had escaped he was building up his strong light dome of life proportion cried the old man proportion and it hung there proportioned and beautiful in the dark confused horror of his desires solid and strong and durable among his broken thoughts time flowed darkly past and now said mrs vavie straightening herself up and giving herself a little shake now we'll drive to hampstead and have a look at piers cotton end of chapter twenty two end of antique hay by aldous huxley